Um, so my task basically is to give you guys a, both a conceptual overview of this emerging field of social genomics or how social, <laughs> cultural, and environmental forces uh, influence the way our bodies work, but also actually to, to express it slightly differently in more classically anthropological terms. Uh, help us start thinking about our bodies not so much as products of the human genome, as products of culture. Our bodies, in some sense, you can think of, especially at the molecular level, as artifacts, essentially, things that culture makes. And we'll talk about how that happens at the high level, and then I'll talk a little bit about why we selected the particular uh, portfolio of speakers that follows me to exemplify certain components of, of the overarching argument. So this idea that our body is a product of culture or a product of psychology, perceptions, beliefs, that kind of thing, seems a little bit weird uh, to, to people in general, particularly to people with a Western or American mindset especially, because we think of our bodies as somehow, uh, as, as Greg was talking about earlier, isolated from the rest of humanity, the rest of reality. I feel like my body is a stable biological entity that lives in the world but is fundamentally separate from it. Um, so I feel like I'm the same person I was a month ago, and I feel like I would be the same person today if I came to this meeting as I would be if I had gone to the beach instead. What we have discovered as we've developed this amazing infrastructure for actually looking at the molecular biology of bodies is that in reality our bodies function very differently than our intuitions would suggest. At the molecular level we're far more fluid and far more permeable to environmental influence than we uh, typically appreciate. The fluidity comes from the fact that we, uh, although we think of our bodies as persistent over time, in fact, they're constantly involved in a process of cell regeneration. So the average protein in the human body has a half-life of about 80 days. That means every day I need to replace about 1 to 2 percent of the molecular meat. And that process of continual cell regeneration at the protein level is mediated by the expression of genes. So genes you can think of as strings of DNA with a, a coding region kind of cartooned there in a, a, a sort of a rectangle that actually is going to be translated into RNA, uh, transcribed into RNA and translated into proteins and go off and change cellular function and behavior and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that is actually silent uh, by itself. For a gene to actually have an influence on what a cell does or how a human works, that gene needs to be expressed. A protein transcription factor needs to bind to the DNA sequences upstream of that coding region of the gene and actually flag that gene for transcription into RNA and then the subsequent production of protein and, if you will, cellular behavior. Uh, I come from medical school, so pardon me in advance. All of my slides talk about health as the outcome, but you can basically think of the rest of human existence, behavior, and all that kind of thing as uh, e equally explainable outcomes from these kinds of systems. So that is a highly contingent process. If you look at any cell type at any given point in time, only the minority of our 20,000 or so human genes is actually actively transcribed. So there's a lot of decision making that takes place, a lot of selectivity in determining which, if you, if you can think of us as sort of our DNA genomes as conferring an envelope of human possibilities in the sense that Greg talked about earlier, um, the, there's a lot of selection of which of those many possible genomic cells is actually going to be realized at the RNA level. So that's where the fluidity comes from. The permeability comes from the fact that this process of regulated gene expression, this, this contingent expression of, of DNA conferred potential, <coughs> is taking place inside cells that are themselves sensitive to the environment. Uh, that includes the physical chemical environment, but it also includes the psychological, social, and cultural environment. So, that happens when, for example, social forces impinge upon our, our minds and brains in ways that create biochemical representations within the body, things like neurotransmitter release or uh, the production of hormones that circulate throughout the body, uh, interact with receptors on the surface of these cells, and those receptors are hooked up to these transcription factors, these on-off switches for gene expression. So that allows things that are fundamentally outside us may not even be physical events, except perhaps at the level of photons falling on a retina or uh, airwaves bouncing across my ears to become real biochemistry within the body that flips on or, or suppresses the activity of particular genes. So that creates this potential for the social environment to regulate gene expression. In principle, what we uh, don't know, or at least historically haven't known, but are now in actually a surprisingly good position to answer is empirically, how often does that happen? 
So uh, we'll start with a simple experiment where cause and effect is really clear, and then we'll kind of get into sort of how we try and walk these principles out into real human existence in a moment. But let's start with something where we can do an experiment, this rat. This rat, uh, like all rats normally, would play, spend most of its life playing with other rats, sleeping with other rats. Rats you can basically think of as living in piles of other rats. They are incredibly social beings. Not, it turns out, as social as humans. But if it happens for a rat, almost certainly it's going to happen for us as well, maybe not in exactly the same way. So great, we've got this intrinsically social creature. Social world means a lot to how these individuals develop and thrive. Uh, let's take our rat and raise it uh, up to the point where it's an autonomous individual, basically to wean, and then put it in its own private luxury apartment. Great apartment, nice, it gets fed all the time, things are great, except that there's no other rats around. So, does that actually change gene expression, or to put it another way, which genes are affected by this, which genes aren't, what does this all mean? That's kind of the overarching theme of what we'll be talking about today. So we can, in inconveniently for this particular rat, we, after a few weeks of this rearing and isolation, take out its brain and assay the expression of all rat genes, about 1,000 or so rat genes. And this uh, heat plot up here basically represents the set of findings uh, for genes that show particularly dramatic differences in activity as a function of social conditions. Uh, these are RNA samples from the prefrontal cortices of these rats. We looked at lots of other brain areas and see similar kinds of dynamics in principle. So that heat plot, basically rows of the heat plot correspond to individual rats. Columns correspond to the expression of one of the maybe 1,800 or so genes here that showed a greater than 50% difference in average expression across the isolated rats versus the group housed rats. And to the extent that the intersection defined by the intersection of, of one of these rows and columns, to the extent that that cell is colored red, that gene is expressed at high levels in that rat. To the extent it's colored green, it's expressed at relatively low levels. So those organized blocks of red and green basically reflect big tranches of genes that are systematically activated, being transcribed at much higher levels, 50% higher or greater in the isolated rat, about 300 genes selectively suppressed in the prefrontal cortices. Um, so this is not a phenomenon that's particularly unique to the rat, and it's not particularly unique to the brain. We can look at, it's, it turns out, a surprising array of other tissues in the body and see similar kinds of dynamics. So for instance, if we look at circulating white blood cells, cells of the immune system, why they should be paying attention to our social lives, I don't know. But empirically, as we'll hear from John Cacioppo later, if you look at the expression of genes within cells of the immune system, they too know whether you're connected up with lots of other uh, members of your species or whether you're kind of on your own. Um, about 200 genes seem to be particularly sensitive to those dynamics. Um, these organized changes in gene expression, uh, we understand a fair amount about how they take place, particularly in model systems, but in ways that seem to check out pretty well when we try and walk these things somewhat tentatively into uh, human existence. We know, for example, that this process, this, if, if you will, association between social environmental conditions and what's happening at the level of the genome uh, is, is mediated first and foremost by changes in, uh, you could think of it as mental or your soul, or if you're getting more reductionist, central nervous system activity. Uh, and we know that that subjective experience of the social environment is of paramount importance in these dynamics because if we look at situations like John Cacioppo's lonely people with this shift in gene expression in cells of their immune system, it turns out that it's your subjective experience of isolation that has the biggest claim on the genome. Objective social isolation, which surprisingly correlates relatively poorly with subjective social isolation, as John will probably talk about, that has a claim on about 200 genes in the immune system cells, uh, probably about mm, maybe 80 to 100 genes are sensitive to actually empirically whether other humans are around, regardless of how you feel about that. So your subjective experience of the social world is the effective experience of the social world for a large trench of genes like that. So this subjective experience at the level of the brain and how we think about things is of a significant uh, and sort of central importance really in this. Those dynamics end up being pumped out into the rest of the body through our nervous and endocrine systems. That, in turn, as we described earlier in that little cartoon, ends up interacting with this cellular signal transduction machinery, and that's what activates those transcription factors that are the proximal drivers of the changes in gene expression that we see. 
So if we've got this simple cartoon system here, uh, we can ask some, some simple questions about it, like which particular genes are sensitive to social processes, as we talked about even in the prefrontal cortices, only about nine to 10% of that lonely rat's genes were actually uh, fluxing in expression or activity as a function of this relatively dramatic change in the social environment. If we look in the white blood cells, it's more close to maybe two to 5% of our total complement of about 20,000 genes that are actually notably sensitive to social environmental conditions. So is that just a random sampling of genes or is, are there some organized conspiracies here? Is there some design about which types of genes are sensitive to these dynamics? Which transcription control pathways are carrying socio-environmental information? We could on some level think about those protein transcription factors as being representations of our experience of what's going on outside in the world. So there should, in principle, be a meaning of a transcription factor, some mapping of our experience of life onto this particular biochemical signal. We should be able to kind of sniff out those associations. And we might ask, how do individual differences in gene sequence, how does you know, the relatively small, but still you know, notably influential polymorphism in human genome sequence, how does that interact with that? Might that render some people more sensitive to socio-environmental influences, rendering other people more uh, sort of robust or, or resilient against this kind of socio-environmental perturbation of gene expression? So we'll talk a little bit at a high level about those kinds of questions. Um, so what types of genes are sensitive? Uh, let's look through the lens of the immune cell again, which we understand pretty well. So it becomes a great place to try and, and, and sort of do the training wheels version of interpreting these kinds of dynamics. We know a lot about what immune cells do. It's frankly much harder for me to look at brain cells and figure out why, uh, what, what the design principle is. So let's start with the immune system. Let's look at these genes that are upregulated, those 78 or so genes. Uh, those genes, uh, are not, it turns out, a random smattering of our 22,000 genes. They actually reflect a small number of coherent, organized conspiracies, functional commonalities. So for instance, one big block of genes within that group is involved in inflammation or the early stages of an immune response uh, that happen immediately upon tissue damage and actually happen sometimes in anticipation of tissue damage. Uh, that's one group that gets upregulated. There's a couple of groups, though, that get downregulated, uh, including genes that defend us against viral infections or other kinds of intracellular pathogens, so-called type 1 interferons, and one subset of antibody encoding genes. Most of our antibodies aren't particularly lashed to these kinds of socio-environmental conditions, but one particular kind, it turns out, is. So that kind of dynamic um, is, when we initially saw this, we thought, oh, that's Interesting, there must be something going on in epidemiology that's driving these kinds of things, and we can understand how social isolation might influence that. What's been more of a surprise is when we started looking at a variety of other kinds of adverse socio-environmental conditions or adverse human experience, we kept seeing that same profile emerge time and time again. Lots of other things happened as well, but there seems to be this core, uh, if you will, transcriptional response to experienced adversity that was manifesting itself across a variety of different uh, rough and, and unpleasant uh, ways of, of being in the world. So uh, this, it turns out, is a causal effect. We can, for example, then uh, experimentally create adverse social conditions. In fact, um, I think John, or sorry, Steve Sumi will be talking about his paradigm where he takes animals early in life and randomizes them to uh, either spend the first few months of their lives in the stable social world created by a mom or uh, in basically this chaotic environment filled only with other rambunctious young kids and no you know, sort of like uh, adults in the room at all, creating a little bit more stressful environment. Uh, let's look at the white blood cells from those animals. Uh, the mother-reared animals, about 500 genes, relatively upregulated compared to the peer-reared, more chaotic uh, life, uh, and about 700 genes relatively activated in this more chaotic life. Uh, again, if we sift through there and ask, what are the functional characteristics of these genes, we find that same theme. Inflammation-related genes upregulated, genes involved in these antiviral responses and this particular type of antibody response downregulated. So, Clearly, because he's manipulating the social environment, this is not a case where somehow the genome is changing social experience. This is social experience changing what's happening at the level of the expressed or the realized potential of the macaque's DNA. So we've taken to calling this the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. 
not a very charismatic name, I'll bring you that, <laughs> but uh, actually does capture a couple of things we, we like, uh, one of them being it, it seems to be conserved across different kinds of objective social experience and also conserved across uh, at least some degree of evolution. We can see it as far down as, as very different mammals. We haven't quite looked at, at snails and things like that, but that's probably on our agenda. So uh, th that's what's happening. Lots of different objective experiences are, uh, lots of different objective conditions are being experienced in some kind of similar way that has similar biochemical uh, consequences or representations <laughs> within the body. Uh, what's happening at the level of the immune cell is this basal transcriptional sequence that these uh, immune cells have that uh, is pretty strong in defending them against viruses is being swept aside some quantitative extent to create more space for uh, immune response gene expression that would be helpful at protecting you against vi uh, bacterial infections. So the immune system seems to be programmed at rest under happy conditions to really defend you against one kind of pathogen, intracellular pathogens like viruses, and when you feel like you're in trouble, it starts shifting its, its sort of, if you will, uh, default stance about what kind of response it's going to be ready to make. Uh, why on earth would that be the case? We, we spent about five years sort of uh, unproductively thinking about that and actually <laughs> chatting with uh, anthropologists was uh, the, the key to actually having, you know, I was like, okay, well, what are hunter-gatherers doing out there and when would they feel this way and what sense does it make uh, for all this to happen for them? And eventually, uh, it actually became clear that uh, you know, if you think about intrinsically social species, it actually does make some sense to change your default immune response, your default defensive stance, because changes in the social environment and your subjective experience of life have big implications for the nature of the pathogens that you're most likely to confront. So uh, we could potentially think of there evolving a couple of different social genomic programs in uh, human immune cells. One for the uh, world that is sort of the safe uh, default, presumably, you know, sort of long-term normal mode uh, where we're closely attached to other human beings, uh, in which case it turns out we are fat targets for viral infections. Viruses basically can infect one human being only by hopping from another human being. The vast majority of viral infections come from another individual. That is not true of bacterial infections. Bacterial infections generally come from tissue damage of some sort or another. Tissue damage, disproportionately, is unlikely when you're surrounded by conspecifics who like you. That's the whole point of sociality. That was Hamilton's recognition, that individual survival is greatly facilitated by collective, uh, you know, sort of social grouping. Uh, individual human beings are at elevated risk for a variety of different types of diseases, all mediated by injury. So this shift in the kinds of, of diseases that you're confronting from viral infections, from close you can think of it as positive social conditions to uh, a greater risk of injury or wounding related bacterial infections when you're uh, either on your own or you're confronted by hostile conspecifics. Oh, that, you know, that, that actually might have enough explanatory power to you know, sort of explain why you would lash these basal defensive stances to our perceptions of the world. Is it a safe place? Is it a dangerous place? Under close social contact, make sure you're ready for the viruses that are coming your way. No virus is coming your way if you're on your own, but boy, you better get ready for those wound-related bacterial infections. So that's kind of a quick tour through how we would go about doing this kind of thing in other tissue systems. We'd love to do this in the brain, but it's a lot harder to get brain tissue for these kinds of studies, especially from humans. Um, so that next question, which transcription control pathways are involved? Uh, I'm not going to bore you guys with the fine physiologic details of all this kind of stuff. Just suffice it to say that if you wanted to, you could track down how different experiences of the social world end up being converted into different kinds of biochemical representations. For instance, fight or flight stress responses versus the kind of cortisol-mediated stress response that happens when you're confronting more profound, overwhelming threats. Uh, what's interesting is that these the, you know, they're both stress responses, but they lash up to slightly different experiences of the world. One where you think you can do it and you're going to try really hard, and the other one where you're just overwhelmed and you go into this more sort of defensive or withdrawal-based response. Those two experiences are lashed up or wired onto the human genome in different ways. They have some common effects, uh, but uh, the, the more profound, overwhelming stress, for example, is programmed to shut down both of the key response systems, this antiviral system and the inflammatory system, 
Whereas this more fight or flight system shuts down the antiviral response, but actually activates this more inflammation sort of immediate defensive response. So different kinds of psychology, because they turn into different biochemical representations, end up having somewhat different claims on what's going to happen at the level of gene expression responses. So one of the things that we can do to try and sniff out these programs is measure RNA, which we're terrifically good at. We have incredibly lucky chemistry at the level of RNA and DNA. We can measure it at very fine concentrations, great reliability, and huge parallel measurement systems. So we can go to the RNA, which we can read out really well, and then go back to the human genome sequence and say, if I want to know which transcription factor is responsible for this conspiracy of RNAs, one of the things I can do is I can go into the genome sequence and the promoters of these genes, those regulatory regions, and see whether there's some suspicious over-representation of the particular DNA motifs that these transcription factors like to bind to. So if I see all of those genes that I was just talking about having in common, for instance, a DNA motif that the transcription factor CREB likes to bind to, I might make this guess, wow, CREB is at least a good candidate for what is carrying this socio-environmental information into this change in gene expression. From that, I can make inferences about which receptor systems might be involved, because I know to some extent which receptors CREB is hooked up to. So we can kind of work backward or reverse engineer this flow of information from the social environment down to the genome, given the just really lucky, elaborate, and sort of interpretive infrastructure, if you will, of the human genome. So if we go to that conserved transcriptional response to adversity, for example, and we look at the genes that are upregulated, they disproportionately include promoter sequences that look like appealing targets for one particular transcription factor called NF-kappa-B. It doesn't even matter what NF-kappa-B is, just suffice it to say, we can pick that out and we know something about what NF-kappa-B does. So this gives us a fairly quick route to inferring the design logic for this system. We can also go into the genes that are downregulated and say, what do they have in common? What's selectively not happening in the lonely people, for example? There, there's a lot of cases where the glucocorticoid receptor, which would normally be activated by cortisol, is not driving changes in gene expression, which is weird because these people generally have, if not similar, sometimes higher levels of glucocorticoid circulating in their body. But somehow that message is not making its way to the genome. There's some, it turns out, interruption at the level of the glucocorticoid receptor that's rendering the human genome partially deaf to that particular incoming wire or signal. What's interesting about that on another level is that normally NF-kappa-B, which is running inflammation and is slightly dangerous if you let it out of control, should be cross-inhibited by the glucocorticoid receptor's activity. If that's not happening, NF-kappa-B is kind of on a little bit longer leash. That's probably why we're seeing these increases in inflammatory gene expression as a consequence of that, fertilizing a lot of disease risks. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that just NF-kappa-B and the glucocorticoid receptor are the only transcription factors involved. That's just, there's lots of others that seem to be recurrently involved. But this notion that we can kind of bioinformatically go in there and start to extract meaning from nucleotides is, frankly, a huge gift in terms of our ability to make sense of what's going on here. So that's how we go about kind of filling in, if you will, the social signal transduction pathways or making the leap from our experience of the world and its proximal biochemical representations to the more genome proximal activity of transcription factors. All right, so since we're talking genome, how is it that genetic polymorphism comes into the story here? Well, one place where this flow of social information interacts literally with DNA is at the level of that binding of the transcription factor, hopefully I'm not going to blind any of us here, to the regulatory region of the gene right there. So if I've got a G there and you've got a C there, that has the potential to change the affinity of that transcription factor for this gene promoter. In other words, it has the potential to, if not completely unhook this gene from this stimulus, at the very least change the sensitivity or the gain of this input-output relationship. So let's talk about a concrete example of this kind of thing. But the conceptual story is that if you can't bind that transcription factor, none of the rest of that system happens, and you now have essentially removed this input-output relationship that evolution in people with the Gs 
has deemed uh, a sensible thing to do, but apparently for the seas is, is not a sensible thing. So let's go to uh, the human IL-6 gene, which is uh, disproportionately influential for human health, so it's uh, kind of a good candidate to work for. Uh, and let's look upstream. It turns out there is this nucleotide sequence, uh, 174 nucleotides upstream of where the IL-6 gene starts being transcribed. And that particular sequence right there is a really appealing target for one transcription factor that we know from a lot of different studies is implicated in shaping these gene expression responses to adversity uh, called GATA1. And it has a friend, GATA3, that also likes to bind to that particular point. So this is the ancestral version of the human genome right here. For about 20% of people of Northern European ancestry, they have a single substitution of uh, a G for a C at that point, which actually changes the affinity of the GATA1 transcription factor. It now actually uh, is much less likely to bind there and carry this information, whatever it is that GATAs are responsible for carrying, uh, is, is going to impinge on the human IL-6 gene differently. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this demonstration, but if we do a cell culture experiment to make sure that this computational prediction here is right, it turns out it is. People with the ancestral version of the human genome, if you throw a biochemical representation of adversity, like norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system, at that promoter, uh, you'll activate the IL-6 gene by about 9 to 10-fold. If you do that in people that have this less sensitive, got an insensitive C allele of the promoter, uh, but everything else identical, uh, you get much less induction, a much less sensitive system. So if that's true in real human life, then that input-output relationship should be strong for people that have the GATA sensitive G allele. In other words, people who are confronting substantial life adversity should show more IL-6 production, and we know that IL-6 works like fertilizer for a lot of diseases that actually kill us, things like cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases, lots of types of cancer. And this is exactly what you see in people that have the um, sort of the ancestral uh, version of the human genome. So both of their IL-6 genes have Gs at that particular site. Uh, if they confront adverse life circumstances sufficient to generate depressive symptoms, bad stuff, all kinds of different bad stuff, but it, what they share in common is it's bad enough to make you feel overwhelmed and defeated. Uh, those people have about a three to a five year acceleration in mortality times, particularly if they're uh, in, in old life. This is not so strong a dynamic in younger individuals because they don't die very often. But in older people who are, are basically you know, in the throes of this battle between inflammation uh, and, and you know, sort of inflammation protecting you, but also inflammation in the long term kind of mortgaging your future, um, that actually this is where you start to pay that price. For people uh, who have the GATA insensitive C allele of the promoter, if that theory is right, they should be protected from this dynamic. There should be uh, still all kinds of adversity happening to them, lots of GATA activation, but if there's less IL-6 response, you should see much less uh, increment in inflammation-related disease and mortality. And in fact, that's exactly what you see. So in older individuals that have one or both of their IL-6 genes, uh, with this GATA insensitive, or you can think of it as stress insensitive version of the IL-6 promoter, that effect is largely abrogated. So what you've got is adversity uh, in the social environment getting converted by the brain into this biochemical signal interacting with a particular receptor. That receptor activates this particular transcription factor. It hits lots of genes, including this IL-6 gene, and as a consequence, you get inflammation, fertilizing diseases that add up to death. With just this one polymorphism, that knocks out the ability of this signal to interact with that gene, you essentially unhook that input-output relationship. Now, don't run around thinking this is going to happen all the time. Remember, IL-6 is unusually influential. Most genetic polymorphisms have no detectable effect on anything at all. So it's not like we're big, you know, sort of big bundles of huge amounts of these wiring differences. But there are uh, lots of cases where uh, there, there are what you might call these plasticity sites, these sensitivity sites in the human genome that make us more or less sensitive to what's happening outside in the world, particularly effectively as interpreted by our, our minds. Uh, same thing is happening with epigenetics. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, epigenetics has the effect of, again, blocking transcription factor interactions with DNA and um, uh, essentially disconnecting these input-output relationships <coughs> in a similar kind of way. So, um, that is uh, sort of a, a quick tour on how we can take 
what geneticists think of genetics and interact with this more sort of functional genomics approach, looking at how the world or the environment gets changed into the proximal biochemistry here. There are some more complicated questions. We've actually made pretty good progress on um, those kinds of relatively simple questions over the last five to 10 years or so. Uh, there are a few things that are bigger, uh, more, more complicated, but ultimately likely more rewarding uh, questions that are we're kind of uh, just in the early phases of uh, sort of responding to or, or delving into. One of these has to do with the fact that although for convenience sake I've shown this as a uh, you know, sort of a directed graph with all the arrows pointing down in this kind of simple cause-effect relationship, in reality that's not what's happening. In reality, um, there is this opportunity for the genomic response to modify the system, to recursively alter it, and as a consequence give it a certain kind of temporal persistence that um, is sort of hard to recognize, but uh, actually pro possibly profoundly important. So here's an example where uh, in John Capitano's studies, who you'll also hear from today, he takes adult rhesus macaques and puts them into unstable social conditions or stable social conditions. Under unstable social conditions, the animals are a little bit stressed, but they're not physically injured or anything else truly crazy. Um, as a function of that, you more than double the expression of this particular gene called NGF. NGF is the nerve growth factor gene. As the name would suggest, if you look in tissues, in this case we're looking in lymph nodes, <coughs> you find that, lo and behold, there are about two to four times as many nerve fibers inside the tissue in these animals that have been socially stressed for as little as a couple of weeks. Within a couple of weeks, you can express, you can go through enough cycles of gene expression to actually change the arborization or the, if you will, the width of the neural pipeline from the brain and presumably the ecology into tissue here. So there's a couple of consequences to that. The first is that any biological process that's hooked up to sympathetic nervous system signaling here, fight or flight stress responses, is gonna happen with greater intensity in these animals. So for instance, we talked earlier about these type one interferons being suppressed by the activity of this system. These animals have about 80% less type one interferon in their lymph nodes. And John will show you that when these animals then run into a viral infection, they get sick and they die faster as a function of that. They can't mount uh, an immune response against this virus anywhere near as efficiently as these animals that aren't under social stress. But the other thing that's important is, you know, the nervous system itself is part of this signaling machinery. So to the extent that these genes, for instance, the nerve growth factor gene now changes our peripheral neurobiology, that feedback has the potential to sort of propagate this kind of dynamic. In other words, even if social conditions change, and there's no longer this ecological drive to express these kinds of adversity-related genes, there's still this sensitization that's happened as a function of this experience that's gonna persist, again, for an average of 80 days at the protein level, that's gonna kind of keep this system going. It's gonna give it temporal inertia. Uh, and that actually can happen at every level of the system, at the brain, at the level of receptors on cells, transcription factors, remember our poor isolated rat. That 1,800 or so genes that are changing in expression probably means something significant about how the prefrontal cortex is working. I can't tell you exactly what that is right now, but it's almost certainly something uh, that, that has the potential to modify the output from that portion of the brain uh, into the rest of the body and into uh, behavior as well. So if we think sort of uh, in a kind of a systems biology level as bodies being machines for converting environmental inputs into outputs, outputs including behavior, which is ultimately what matters, it's behavior that is selected, uh, but also outputs including RNA. What's distinctive about that is that RNA is then structuring the characteristics of the body in the future. In other words, it's a function of environmental variables at time one. The body you have at time two is going to be subtly different um, at the range of two to five percent or maybe 10 percent of genes uh, differentially expressed depending on the tissues and the nature of the environment and that kind of thing. But the conceptual point is that body now, as a function of its history, is going to respond to current environments in a way that's potentially different than it would have if it had a different history. In other words, it's going to produce different behavioral outputs, different RNA outputs, and those RNA outputs, again, have the potential to structure the function of the body going forward in the future. So, you can think of these sort of temporal sequence of, of transcriptomes, these RNA systems, as being in some sense a biochemical record 
of our body's adaptation to the environmental conditions that we have had to confront over the course of our personal histories. In other words, RNA becomes a record of intraorganismic adaptation in the same way that DNA is argued to be a representation of our species' history of adaptation to the environments that we've, we've encountered. So that creates some, some kind of crazy uh, implications. Like, if you start then at some time out in the future, of course I expect you to read that paper and so on. <laughs> um, if you can actually go out and say, okay, well, if this is really true, if what's happened in my history is, is changing the way my genome expresses itself right now, and I have some kind of ability to map particular profiles of gene expression onto particular natures of, of early earlier uh, life conditions, I might be able to look at people's current gene expression profiles and sort of predict what kind of an early life they had. Now that sounds completely insane, but Edith Chen, who we'll talk later today, has actually accomplished that. So they go and look at people who are enjoying, for instance, favorable socio-environmental conditions right now, high SES, or at least mid to high SES, and they can still sniff out the ones that were born in adverse low SES conditions, uh, not with terrific predictive capacity, but the fact that you find anything there at all is, I think, remarkable. As a genomicist, I'm used to zero correlations all the time. So the fact that there's a signal hanging around at, you know, sort of like 10 or 20 years after this early life experience has basically, uh, you know, sort of empirically gone away, that is pretty remarkable. So that's one of our not so simple questions. It was also a lengthy one. I'll make the other one short. Social programming of non-immune tissues. We can get white blood cells out of people pretty easily, out of monkeys, out of all kinds of things. But how about the nervous system or, for instance, the reproductive systems? Two of the key uh, sort of, if you will, pivotal systems for evolution and, and sort of the, the rationalization of gene expression programs. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there. One of the things that's important at the systems level is that particularly if you're modulating CNS function, that has the function of changing the environment uh, in, in both physical and effective ways. So for instance, it, it can change, you can actually go out and physically change the environment or you can select yourself into a different environment. But as a function of that, you are sending information out into the world and that world, because it is driving these processes that are going back into your brain, creates another recursive loop that is probably going to turn out to be uh, empirically very important. It seems like it might be a subtle dynamic, but the more we see humans with relatively minor genetic variations assorting themselves into different environmental niches, probably the stronger this kind of added loop of, of recursion is going to be. Um, and that brings up this broader question of like, how do we make sense of a genome if part of its regulation comes from outside it? Uh, I think it's futile, for example, for us to go into a sequenced human genome and think we understand how that thing is going to work. I don't think we can understand very much about it until we know what other genomes are around it, uh, if any. I mean, if it's isolated, for example, it's going to function in a very different way than we've already seen. But certainly, uh, this, this, this story of uh, individuals influencing one another through this socio-environmental signal transduction uh, has to have some kind of implication on how the gene uh, system itself has kind of evolved and stabilized. So another way to think of it is that, uh, you know, some of the regulatory logic of this particular genome is distributed. It's governed by what's happening in other genomes nearby or other bodies and friends and families and pets and all that kind of stuff. That probably has, if it's been around long enough, play, it's, it's been in some sense the affordances of our social environments have probably been incorporated into the fundamental regulatory logic of our genomes, and we probably cannot understand genome function in isolation from other individuals. So uh, I've probably blown through my time here. I'm great apologies. If they told me something, I'd cancel it, so I thought I'd take all of this time. So, um, the, the, the key take-home point I want to leave you with, you can forget all the biochemistry. Okay. Um, actually, I, I agree with Marco. All that's really important is philosophy. And so the philosophy <laughs> that I'd like to leave you with is that the things that happen to you today, and especially your experience of them, are going to subtly, in general, influence the molecular composition of your body uh, for the next two to three months. That's about how long the proteins that are produced in your body are going to be hanging around uh, in your tissues for uh, you know, you know, sort of what you might call the first order effect of a signal that comes in today. Or if those proteins actually hook into one of these recursive systems with this kind of temporal persistence due to feedback, uh, 
potentially, these things are going to change what's going on for the rest of your life. Now, the things that have the magnitude to do that are very rare, but they probably are out there. So on one level, that's pretty terrifying. It means one, it means I, I like you guys, but I probably should have gone to the beach. Uh, but the other <laughs> is that it pr provides, I mean, we spent a lot of time in the medical school trying to figure out how we're going to fix people's genes. We bombard them with viruses to try and fix their genes. We you know, give them chemicals and stuff like that. But actually, every single day when we make decisions about who we're going to spend time with and what we're going to do, we're changing. <laughs> So uh, on some level, although we don't experience it as such, there is such a synchrony between what our genomes in, are doing and how we feel and experience the world that uh, you know probably the best gene therapy is going to come from leading the life that we ourselves feel that we were meant to lead. Uh, so that is the, the kind of the, the uh, pointy headed section of the talk. What I'm going to do now is sort of explain uh, why the great empirical uh, demonstrations that you'll see in the, in the next four talks were specifically selected here. So um, coffee break apparently already happened, so much for that. Uh, next, socioeconomic status. What, what Edith is going to do is basically talk a little bit about how the social environment uh, comes to be associated with changes in gene expression that are measured at, at distant points in time. Uh, Steve Sumi is then going to show you, I can take this into a monkey model. He, he started doing this probably before Edith started making her case in humans, uh, Steve's going to show you how in experimental systems you can actually tease out early life social experiences and how they play on genomes. Uh, then John Capitano is going to look in another monkey model at adults and say, even if you're out of this developmental plasticity phase, still, what's happening in the social world changes what's going on inside your body, and that can have big uh, consequences for, in his case, health. But I think you could easily generalize that to lots of other things that mediate behavior and the production of culture and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do with lunch, but uh, they, they'll, they'll figure it out, not my problem. After lunch, <laughs> when everybody is uh, ready for him, John is going to basically uh, do a kind of another conceptual updraft and go from the world of the neural and endocrine system and these gene expression dynamics back up to um, sort of human social experience and perception and think in very teleological or evolutionary terms about why these systems have developed the way that they have. Uh, and then we'll have Yada Ritz and Carol Worthman talk a little bit about, hopefully they will effectively translate this into terms that are, are useful and productive for you because we confess to being predominantly psychologists in background and our acquaintance with anthropology perhaps not sufficient to really you know, sort of meet you halfway. So hopefully they'll, they'll help us translate as well. That's what we have on the agenda. So without further ado, I think it is Edith's turn. <laughs>